Greetings in Jesus' name. Uh, it's a joy to have this opportunity to, to bring a message to uh, this gathering, a conference, Nameco. Uh, thank you for including me uh, in this. Uh, I miss Africa and uh, miss all of you. Uh, I miss being part of the fellowship and singing and dancing with all of you and just have, having a lot of fun. But I'm thankful for each one of you, for your prayers for me and my family. Uh, the Lord is continuing to lead us and guide us in the ministry that he has given us these days. I've been asked to, uh, to speak on a subject matter of uh, spiritual health or men's spiritual health. And uh, as I thought about it, uh, there are many ways to approach this subject. One will be to provide a list of things that we should do to, uh, to remain focused and remain healthy in our walk with the Lord. Um, uh, growing up in a pastoral home, I benefited a lot from my parents' guidance and helping me to know how to grow in my spiritual walk with the Lord. Uh, spent a lot of time <clears throat> learning how to read the Bible, how to spend time in prayer, how to have quiet time, how to value uh, devotional time and several resources that uh, were important for me as a young man and now as a man for my own growth and health and uh, spiritual walk with the Lord. So there are many ways we could approach the subject of spiritual health. But as I began to think more about our time, I decided to approach it from a perspective of Paul. Uh, Paul, in his writings, in most of his letters, he talks a lot about uh, participation in Christ, sharing in Christ, um, giving an emphasis that uh, as the people of God, we are called to participate in the very life of God, Yes, it's participation in mission, but it's also participation in the life of God. In that way, following and getting to know God, not just having a head knowledge, but experiential and relational knowledge as we walk with the Lord. So I chose a passage that um, is found in, in the book of Philippians. Uh, Paul was talking to the people uh, the church in Philippi, and uh, there were many things he was addressing with them, but certainly one of them was related to their spiritual health, and it will come through as we continue to reflect on this text. So Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 3 to verse 11. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. It is clear from this text that Paul had a warm relationship with the church in Philippi. He says the church in Philippi holds him in their heart and he longs for them with compassion of the gospel and they share in the grace of God. 
It is no surprise that Paul shares with his congregation that he is thankful for them and he prays for them with joy. His thanksgiving is directed to God for the church. I found it interesting that he includes this statement, all of you. The insertion, all of you, or in my prayers for all of you, emphasizes Paul's heart, how Paul views the church. Paul's prayer is not just for a segment of the church. He emphasizes inclusiveness. It is a prayer for the whole church. This is important because in verse 5, he tells us that he has joy because this congregation, all of you, shared in the gospel. Again, not a segment of the church, but the whole church partnering or participating in sharing the gospel. The entire church is called to embody the gospel, to become the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is characteristic of Paul to include all, regardless of where they are on their spiritual journey. Paul believed in shared participation in Christ, a church that is united in Christ. Paul himself identifies himself with these believers. They were all one body of Christ. So Paul also reminds this church that their participation in God's mission is possible or is made possible by God. It is God who began the work in the church, and it is God who is continuing the work to shape them as they continue to grow. He helped them. God helps them grow in love, increase in spiritual knowledge and moral discernment, regardless of the circumstances and cultural obstacles that they were or would face along the journey. Nothing should stop them or prevent them from becoming the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. The church is called and enabled by God to share in the gospel. So as I think about the uh, being a, a church or the man uh, who are on a journey, on a spiritual journey or a spiritual health, we are reminded in this text that we are a people of God who were brought into a relationship with God by Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ. It is through the power of God that we are enabled to share in the life of God and to share with one another. So Paul emphasized this participation, which we read um, as we began this text, as he says, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. What does it mean to share in the gospel? Other translators use the word participation or partnering. Sharing in the gospel speaks of partnering in advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were saved and called to be the church, to live as the people of God, and to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot advance the gospel of Jesus Christ if we do not continue to grow in our walk with the Lord. So sharing in the gospel, it is a call to become the gospel in the world. A church in the Philippi shared in the gospel by praying. The intercessory prayer on behalf of Paul by providing financial support or generosity, 
by being involved in evangelistic work and reaching out to other people. They participated by sending someone to Paul. They shared in the gospel by advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ. They have become a witness to the gospel through their lifestyle, which Paul calls living in a way that is worthy of the gospel. And they have become the gospel or sharing in the gospel by announcing the good news. They shared in the gospel by suffering with Paul for the sake of the gospel. Church, we are called to become the gospel in our world. This is to share in the gospel. To share in the gospel is to live as a sent people, recognizing that God sends us to represent his holiness in the world. We share in the very life and mission of God. I'm sure you know this, but let me remind you that the church does not have a mission apart that which is God's mission. We have a mission because God invites us and brings us together. He, he shapes us, he forms us, and he enables us to participate in his redemptive work in the world. We do not participate in God's mission in our own power, in our own strength. It is through the power of God who sends us and enables us to embody the gospel in the world, that we are able to participate with Christ in his work in the world. We have been called into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. So if we are invited to participate in God's mission in the world, to share in the gospel, or to become the gospel, that is really an invitation in itself to fellowship with God. Because if we are going to represent the holiness of God in the world, we need to abide in God. We need to be transformed by God, to be transformed in the likeness of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 through 9, we read this word. I give thanks to my God always for you because of your grace of God, because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge and of every kind, just as the testimony of, of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him, you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here, Paul again reminds us, God is faithful. And he calls us to be a people who walk in the light, who live a holy life, who are blameless. And he reminds us that God is faithful to do this in our lives. And we were called into fellowship. This word fellowship is the same word of sharing, the same word of partnering, the same word of participating. We were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. God called us to share in the very life of God. Another text in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, he tells us, we declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Here John, he's saying, what we declare, what we proclaim, our witness, our testimony is what we have seen, is what we have heard from the Lord 
but we declare this to the world. We declare this to the church so that they may come to know Jesus, so that they also may come to have fellowship with us, the ones who are sharing the good news. But he pauses and he says, this fellowship is not only fellowship with one another here in the church. It is truly our fellowship with the Father, God, and with Jesus Christ, his Son. So our sharing in the gospel, our participation, our partnering in the gospel, in God's mission, it is truly a participation with God himself, with his son, enabled, empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is a participation in the triune God. Friends, we are participants in the mission that is closer to God's heart. The redemption of humanity and the restoration of the whole creation matter to God. And God invites us to be a people who are sent and participate with him in this mission. The people of God are called to become the gospel, incarnate the gospel, like Jesus Christ, who became flesh and blood for the sake of our salvation. The church must become flesh and blood, become the gospel, so the world will come to know the power of salvation, the power of transformation that is only possible in God. Our spiritual health it is not just for the sake of, oh, I know how best to read the Bible. I know how best to pray. I know how to spend time in the presence of God. Our participation in a spiritual health is with the understanding that God is shaping us and, and enabling us to become the gospel so that many others will come to have fellowship with God. And to write, said, the gospel of God today and tomorrow, as in Paul's day, must become as it did in Jesus, flesh and blood. That which was unveiled before an unprepared world in Jesus Christ must be unveiled again and again as those who believe in Jesus Christ live by the Spirit and in life as well as in word, announcing the gospel to the world. End quote. We are to become that which Christ became as he came to the world, as incarnate Jesus Christ became the gospel, flesh and blood, so people will have the opportunity to know and experience the power of God in their lives, so that we will be invited into fellowship with God, so that many others will be invited into fellowship with God through our ministry, our sharing in the gospel. And Paul, knowing that some may say, well, this is really not easy. We live in a challenging world. How can we be healthy spiritually? He says these words, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. That's in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. The one who began the good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Sharing in the gospel or becoming the gospel is costly. We recognize that our work uh, will not always yield the desired results. Some will accept Jesus 
and the message that we proclaim. Some will see our transformed lives and, and desire to join us and, and fellowship with us and with the Lord. But there will be others who will reject the gospel. There will be others who will reject the Lord. There will be others who will reject our, our lifestyle as we walk with the Lord. And at times, there will be ideologies both inside and outside the church that threaten the advancement of the kingdom of God. This is not new. It has happened before in many places. Still, Paul wants us to understand this, that nothing could stop God's redemptive work. Nothing can stop God's redemptive work. In, in, case, in, in some cases, it, as we see rejection and suffering, persecution, discouragement, and other related challenges, we find ourselves wondering, is there hope? And some of this may even weigh us down at times and lose hope. Paul wants us to be reminded that God is faithful. And let me remind us that our History also attests that we are not ignorant of the challenges that we could potentially face as we go and live as a people of God in the world. So I don't want you to think that I'm suggesting that there will be no challenges, that there will be no rejection, there will be no uh, suffering, there will be no persecution. These things will be there. There will be all these kinds of things that at times weigh people down. Paul is not blinded. I am not blinded. But I know this, that as we share in the gospel, the one who began the good work in our lives, he is faithful. So we are aware that as the consequences of sin, as a consequence of sin and the brokenness in our world, there are many who are blinded in our world. There are many challenges that we will face, but we continue to hold on in the Lord knowing that he is with us and guiding us. The Lord is faithful. Paul reminds us of all of this. So hold on to the Lord and have the confidence in knowing that he is working in your life. He is guiding you. Yes, there may be others who are blinded. There may be others who will harden their hearts. Yet it is precisely because of this that we are eager to share in the gospel, recognizing that salvation begins in God and is already in progress. Salvation does not begin in us, begins in God, and it's in progress. God's saving activity is in progress. Those who are in Christ, the church, or those of us who are in Christ, we are signpost of God's work of salvation. We are called to continue to grow spiritually because we are God's signpost of God's work of salvation in the world. The work of salvation that God began will be brought to completion when Christ returns. Therefore, the circumstances of this world should not be the determining factor of how we participate in Christ. We are called to participate in Christ always, having confidence in God, who is trustworthy, able, and faithful to bring completion to the work of salvation that he began in us. Do not be deterred by anything. He is faithful to accomplish the work that he began in you. Remember when Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison because of the gospel. Paul and the church in Philippi were facing real issues, challenges in life. Of course, it may look different today, 
but it remains costly. As I mentioned before, we still have persecution. There are countries, nations where people are persecuted for the sake of the gospel. But also others is because of temptation. They are tempted to give up because of the things, the secularism in our world. Paul reminds us that God is trustworthy. He is able. He is faithful. This is good news for the church because the one who began a good work, the good work of our salvation, the good work to bring us into fellowship with one another, the good work to fellowship with God, he will bring it to completion. Essentially, Paul recognized that we live in the yet and not yet time. The kingdom of God has been inaugurated in Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ, the new creation of God, has begun. Salvation is already a present reality in which we participate, empowered by the Holy Spirit. But as we await the return of Jesus, we must have our eyes fixed on Jesus. He does not abandon his church. God's grace sustains the church and gives us all we need for life and service. Hence, we can talk about spiritual health. Because God continues to shape us, continues to help us in our walk with the Lord. In this text that we read, I want to read again verse 9 through verse 11. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Paul is using here what I entitled love, that is infused with knowledge and moral insight. He now has come to to the content of his prayer, what is essential part of his prayer, a prayer that the people of God will abound in love, will overflow in love. Paul was not suggesting that the church was lacking in love or knowledge, or insight. You you remember I mentioned at the beginning that it is characteristic of Paul to be inclusive, to, to say he prays for all, as he talks about participation in Christ or sharing in the gospel or our walk with the Lord. He is inclusive. Everyone, all of us are included. All some are, are matured already in their walk with the Lord. Some are just beginning. They are at the beginning stage. But Paul considers all all as sharing in the gospel. He considers all as a people who are on a journey with the Lord. So he's not suggesting that the church is lacking in love and knowledge and insight. His prayer is that the church will overflow in love, will abound in God's love infused with knowledge. And and as I talk about being infused in knowledge, not only intellectual knowledge, as important as this is, but rather a knowledge that can only be experienced in intimate relationship with Christ. He's praying that we will overflow in love, that it is infused in the depth of insight. That word depth of insight, as we look at it in different parts of the word of God in different writing, it talks really about our moral walk with the Lord. In our 
ethics and as we make decisions, as we walk with the Lord. So Paul prays that as we continue in our journey, our spiritual journey, we will overflow, we will abound in love, infused with knowledge of God and depth of insight. To love the way Jesus loves, we must live in a close relationship with him. It's interesting that in some texts, Jesus tells us we must love our enemies. It's not always easy to love in the way that God loves, but it is possible to love one another with no limits, loving in a way that God loves. To be able to do so, to love our world, to love our brother and our sister in the same way that we love ourselves or we love the Lord, we must live in a close relationship with God to know the fullness of Christ as we share in his suffering. In other words, it is only through our remaining in him, abiding in him, and living in this relationship with God that we can come to a knowledge that it's deeper than the knowledge of facts. It is a relational knowledge. We come to know him in the fullness of his love, of his life, of his mission, of his passion for our world. To know God is much more than knowing concepts or ideas about God. To know God is to enter and live an intimate relationship with God. So we desire to, to be spiritually health. We desire to continue to grow and mature in our walk with the Lord. We must enter and live an intimate relationship with God. So when we go into the Word of God, we go into a time of prayer. We listen to the Word of God preached to us. We read various resources. We have people who hold us accountable as part of our journey, as part of our spiritual health. We do so in recognition that all of this is to draw us closer to the Lord, it is not necessarily to draw us closer to certain authors or certain books or certain messages or certain preachers. As much as, yes, we fellowship and we share and we love these different resources, all of these are means of grace that draw us closer into an intimate relationship with God so we can know God and know Him Yes, intellectually, as we know about him, but even more critically, as we come to know him as our Lord, intimate relationship with God. God is relational. He created us to live in a relationship with him and his creation. However, because of sin, humanity was far from God and unable to restore fellowship with God. It is only by God's grace that we have redemption. It is only by God's grace that we have been restored to live in fellowship with God. It is only by God's grace that we are enabled to have fellowship with one another, to share the good news of salvation with others. It is only by God's grace that we are restored to have relationship not only with one another, but also with the whole tradition. Redemption and restoration are God's will for his creation, and they are made possible in Jesus Christ. Love without knowledge and insight it is not what God desires for us. He desires for us to have love that is filled with the knowledge of God and insight. One of the authors said, blind love 
can result in poor moral judgment or selfish conduct. Paul is not so much praying for a more intense love as more intelligent love. He desires for his Philippian friends a love that evidences a genuine experiential knowledge of God and a pattern of a moral decision that accord with God's will. I like this commentator because this reminds us that what Paul desires for us and my prayer for you as you listen to this message today is that you will have intellectual knowledge. Yes, will overflow in God's love, but you will have intellectual knowledge that is only possible through experiential knowledge of God and a pattern of moral decision that comes only by knowing God's will. You know this because it's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable, and perfect. Of course, you know this because you have had so many times being reminded that we are not to be conformed to the standards of the world, but God's desire is for us to be transformed and be renewed and continue to grow and so that we can discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This in a way, it reminds us that God's work is an ongoing work. He continues his transformational work in our lives. And as already indicated previously, this work will be completed when Christ returns. Therefore, as we are on the journey with Christ, it is vital to recognize that growing in maturity is critical. God makes it possible the renewing in us a right relationship with Him, resulting in living and loving rightly. It is God who makes it possible the renewing, the spiritual health, the growth resulting in us living and loving in the right way, the way of the Lord. Through God's sanctifying work in our lives, the intentions of our hearts are purified and directed towards God's will. The purifying of the heart must also be accompanied by maturity. This is all about spiritual health because you cannot be purified and just be stagnant. God continues his work in your life. So the purifying of the heart must also be accompanied by maturity. One theologian, Diane Leclerc, says it better. Sanctification must be followed by growing maturity. The human part in this sanctification is concentration or devotement. God is the one who does the purifying. First of the intentions and then of the life lived out of this intention. Paul's prayer is that the church will be purified and grow in maturity here and now. Paul believes that this is attainable in this life. Spiritual health is attainable in this life. Maturity is, a, is attainable in this life. Growth in Christ is attainable in this life. And he does not only believe that it is attainable, but he believes that it is essential for becoming the gospel in the world. If our world will come to have fellowship with Christ, if we are going to have fellowship with one another, 
if everyone will come to be invited to have fellowship with God, we must recognize that God purifies us and he enables us to grow in maturity. And this is attainable here in this life as we become the gospel in the world. So we celebrate and rejoice for God's generations of faithfulness, faithful believers who shared in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They overcame the challenges in this world as they continued to live lives worthy of the gospel. They led many people to faith in Jesus Christ. They led many people to experience of entire sanctification. I am thankful for this generation of believers. I am thankful for you, for you share in the gospel, you participate in God's mission by having fellowship with one another, by having fellowship with the Lord. I am thankful for you, for you desire to continue to be in a fellowship with God so that you can grow in your relationship with the Lord, so you can mature in your walk with the Lord. I also assume that some are struggling to hold on to hope. The circumstances of the day are tempting to weigh them down. Here's what I would say to this. Paul reminds us that God's salvation activity is not finished yet. God is continuing his work. God is faithful, able, and trustworthy. He will bring to completion the work he began in you, the work he began in the church. God who saved and sanctified us is continuing his work in us as we grow in maturity in our walk with the Lord. So church, we are called to become the gospel for the sake of our world. Not a people tend in on ourselves, but rather a people concerned for our lives and for the world. Christ has invited us to participate with him in his redemptive mission in the world. So as you envision the future in your walk with the Lord, in your growth, in your maturity, in your spiritual walk, may God lavish on you his love, infused with knowledge and moral insight, recognizing that growth in love is incomplete apart from an increased spiritual knowledge and moral discernment. May you continuously experience God's transformational work in your life and mature in your walk with the Lord, reflecting God's holiness in the world. And may you and may your decisions, and as you make decisions in the world, do so from the fullness of God's love that is in you, the deep relationship, knowledge of God that is in you as you live in God. May God bless you and continue to guide you in your walk with him.